Ladies and gentlemen, moving on to the third and last panel discussion of the day, themed as something old, something new. Things to take into the new normal, and I would like to invite Francesca Ash, publisher, Total Licensing, to kindly take the discussion ahead from here. Good morning. I hope everybody can hear me. Yes, we can. Good. How are you doing, ma'am? Thank you. We're good. Um, you've obviously heard what the title of this seminar is. I want to, here we go. Sorry, I'm pressing buttons. Um, we have three, got <laughs> three speakers today. Um, we'll begin with Jonathan Watson, who is works for Kids Insights. They do a lot of market research, a lot of testing amongst children to really see what consumers want moving forwards. We're then going from cla to classic properties with Carla Silva from King Features. Carla obviously is responsible for properties such as Popeye, to have been around for literally about 100 years, um, and talk about how classics have been popular in, in today's market, uh, particularly because of the pandemic. We'll then move to Chris Tade from Licensing Link in the UK. Chris is going to talk about new media and what is happening in the market, how media is um, absorbed now, how children watch things, how basically how life has changed and how it continues to change. So if we could start with Jonathan, if he's there. Yes, I'm here, thank you. I can't play my video though, the host um, says it's prevented, so uh, I don't think anyone can see me. Um, and yeah. I'm just gonna share my screen if that's okay. Okay. Uh, Francesca, can you see my screen now? Uh, no, I can just see your name. No. Oh. Uh, the host, one second, the host is just, there you can see hey. me now. Hey. And then hopefully I can also share my screen now as well. Yes. Cool. Brilliant. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Watson, and I'm the Chief Product Officer at the Insights People. And like Francesca said, today I'm going to be talking about our Kids Insights India data. Um, for those of those who don't know, um, like Francesca said, uh, Kids Insights is an independent market intelligence service, and we help brands understand the ever-changing attitudes, behaviours, and, and consumptions of the next generation. We do this by serving more than 5,000 different kids per week across the globe, so that equates to over 270,000 kids across the year. And we do this to find out about their lives, from what they're watching, what they're buying, talking about, playing with. And the trends today, I'm going to be talking about our kind of fueled by our research across all these different regions. So we'll be using our knowledge from across Europe, the US and Canada, Latin America, Australia. We've also started recently working in China and Russia, but today, of course, we'll be focusing on some data from India. Um, in India in particular, we survey 410 different kids per week, 21,000 different kids per year. Um, and according to the latest census estimate, there are over 450 million kids in India. However, our survey is online based, um, so we can assume we're only reaching a, a proportion of these, uh, which is internet users, around 35%. Um, if anyone has any questions about where the data comes from, um, there's a link on the last slide to get in touch and we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, and here's some of the kind of amazing brands we work with across India and beyond. But let's now look at some trends because the world in which children live in today uh, is in flux, um, but there are still many trends shaping the, the lives which we can talk about. Um, and I think the best place to start is, is looking at time, time spent. Um, we can see some changes here due to the pandemic. Uh, here we're looking at three different periods, uh, June 2019 to March 20, before the pandemic really took hold. Uh, that's the left bar. The middle bar is March to October. Uh, the kind of the peak pandemic in India where there's the most um, strictest restrictions uh, and then October um, to today uh, where restrictions have started to ease. Um, and what we can see is, as, as we all know, in the peak of the pandemic, digital activities such as gaming, social media, TV all increased. Um, but as you can see there, they actually kind of uh, dropped off a little bit once restrictions started to ease as well. Um, toys were similar. Um, but I think what's really interesting here is how reading and studying actually increased during the pandemic and then continued to increase even further uh, as well throughout the year. And we'll come back to this point a little bit later uh, where we talk about edutainment and the role of entertainment and education and the opportunities for licensing. Um, but yeah, I think re reading is a really interesting one, a classic hobby rising in popularity and uh, we'll be talking lots about new media as well, but I think it's just worth noting that 12% of teenagers in India say reading is their favourite hobby, actually making it more popular than gaming, uh, which is really interesting. 
Um, I'm just going to whiz over this slide with some more data around what times of day kids are doing different activities. But I want to talk about uh, one of the big trends here, which is uh, the, the kind of change in dynamic in family influence. Um, mm -hmm. The pandemic's really changed how families um, spend their time together. Uh, families spending more time together and what we've seen is kids getting a growing influence over the household decisions on shopping, content consumption, food choices. Um, we'd expect this on things like toys and TV subscriptions but what we're increasingly seeing is kids having a say over uh, sectors that wouldn't necessarily concern them or, or yeah, that you'd think. Uh, the purchase of large appliances in the house, the purchase of a new car, and all these, these areas that kids are having an increased say over what their parents buy. So moving forward, we no doubt expect more companies to really expand their appeal of the, and be inclusive of this whole family unit. And I guess what I'm saying is that every brand now must become a family brand um, and reach these young stakeholders. So we had a little brief look at how kids are spending their time. Let's now look at um, some of the content they're consuming and how they're consuming that. Um, so starting with devices. Um, this generation of children prefer personal devices. We know that. Uh, what we might not know is a huge 83% of kids surveyed uh, age 6 to 9 have access to a mobile device. Um, and kind of... For, for many, this is the main the, or the only screen for entertainment in India. Uh, this huge mobile um, mobile access is really a video access driven by affordable data as well. Um, console ownership is low. Less than 20% of 10 to 18s own a console. Um, that's much smaller than regions um, in, across Europe. Uh, it's around 40% across most of Europe. But even in Brazil as well, which is probably more compar comparable to Europe, um, uh, India is much smaller. But in, what's interesting is that although only less than 20% of kids in India have a console, 61% of kids say they game. So they're all gaming on mobile, um, which is an opportunity there uh, for, for further IP and, and, and characters around that. And then smart speakers, I think, is a really interesting one. Uh, they're definitely gaining grounding in, in India. Uh, these devices are really simple and easy to use, even for the youngest children. Um, and, and could really change the way we consume content and even provide new ways to engage with favorite um, IPs. So in terms of what they're actually watching, um, here's, here's some data on, on the most popular stream platforms. But before we look at that data, I think it's just worth noting that um, in August 2019, 35% of kids said they would mostly watch linear broadcast streaming TV. Um, now it's 23%. Um, so you can see the trend there. Uh, there was a there was a bit of a, a surge during the pandemic, but the, you can you can see the longer term trend there. And the battle for for kids' attention is is intense. Amazon's the most popular paid platform according to our data, and, and grew during the pandemic. Um, and it's bid to increase its its footprint in the Indian market as well. It introduced um, a new mobile edition, uh, the only country in which Amazon does that to offer customers this mobile first option. Netflix did something similar last year, and Netflix also recently ran a, a stream fest free weekend of content um, in a competitive market. Uh, but again, Netflix is still one of the most expensive options, um, as, as we know. And again, Netflix and Amazon are also investing in, in local content too. And when it comes to local content, uh, we've got platforms such as MX Player, as we know, which is much more popular with teenagers who aren't on this graph. Um, and again, gained a lot of popularity during the pandemic. So now I'm going to start looking at actually some of the, the favorite shows they're watching. This is for kids aged three to five, um, just the top, uh, the top few shows at the moment. And when it comes to their favorite content, it is local content, such as uh, Motu and Paplu, popular as well as Chota Beam, and the, the global hit Mighty Little Beam, uh, huge increases during the pandemic. Uh, interesting, some of the shows we've seen just outside of these top ones as well, 50% uh, increase in uh, French production, Oggy and the Cockroaches, which sits in 10th place. Um, but I just wanted to, to draw your attention here as well to Tom and Jerry, uh, classic brand, the classic IP, which fits into, I'm sure, some of the themes Carla is going to be talking about. But really interesting because the movie's just been released in India, as we know. Um, I don't think it actually received lots of, of promotion, but it's, I think that's interesting because it's been the first kids theatrical release in a, in a long time anywhere in, in globally. Um, and I know Warner Bros have released that in multiple languages, including Hindi and Tamil as well. So interesting to watch that one. Now I'm going to look at another kind of a, a bigger picture trend when it comes to um, what kids seek out in, in their content and, and 
because what they're seeking out is increasingly more than just entertainment from their from their from their characters. It's it's what we've seen is the pandemics change uh, who is influencing them and who they're learning from. Uh, we recently did some research around kids' role models and heroes to find out who they think are the heroes. And actually, one of the one of the things we found out is that kids are realizing themselves they can be the hero. Um, they care about a huge range of issues. They're concerned about injustices and they really kind of, they judge characters by their own values as well. So it's really important, I think, that characters and IP allows self-expression um, to, and as we can see here, kids' aspirations change uh, depending on familiarity. At the height of the pandemic, we saw that these, what we call everyday heroes shining through in popularity. Kids, instead of wanting to become sports stars and film stars, they wanted to become scientists and doctors and nurses. Uh, so I think these are really interesting uh, considerations to make uh, for creating content and licensed products um, as we enter, um, hopefully, into the, the post-pandemic world. Um, continuing with the theme of, of, of education is, is edutainment. We touched on this earlier. Uh, obviously, the school year has been disrupted uh, this year. Um, we've seen the rise in edutainment. So that's um, education and entertainment blended to make learning fun. Uh, so content and experiences and, and licensed products that can make learning fun uh, have kind of eased that added responsibility that parents have had um, for doing the teaching at home this year. So we've seen a growth in that category. And then going to wrap up by talking about some of the retail trends that we're seeing. Uh, firstly, looking at some of the licensed merchandise kids saying they are either buying or intend to buy or want to buy. Um, we can see here clothes remain the top licensed product for kids, um, both teenagers and younger kids, actually. And it's, you can see here on the right hand side, it is um, TV related merchandise that is driving uh, their interest at the moment. But what's really interesting is how YouTube purchase related purchases are the fastest growing segment. 20% uh, increase during the pandemic of kids either purchasing or wanting to purchase something related to their favorite YouTuber. And children are also becoming more interested in relation, license good relation to their favorite video games um, compared to previous months. Um, and kind of, um, I think Chris is going to talk about this, but the popularity of gaming has really changed uh, licensing and merchandise. And with trend setting IPs comes a whole host of new content, but also we're starting to see digital content and goods also becoming popular now as well, um, a growing market for this. And then just uh, a couple of last trends to wrap up with. Uh, one we all know about, the rise of direct consumer. Um, even at the start of last year, before the pandemic, we uh, surveyed a whole bunch of brands and, and found out how they were in, they anticipating their direct consumer revenue to increase significantly. And that was the part before the pandemic, which really accelerated this trend. And social media giants like Instagram and Facebook have really been tapping into this really enabling brands to sell directly to the consumer. And then finally, what's next for what's next for, for online shopping? Because um, we were doing some analysis and we found that Amazon is the favorite online store of every um, kid in every country we survey, apart from in Brazil, uh, where they prefer Mercado Libre. Um, but what's really interesting is the Amazon shopping experience is almost the same as it was 20 years ago. It's text and picture based. Uh, and so it's perhaps the future of online shopping could resemble something more of a um, of a social media platform with kind of blended entertainment and e-commerce. We know in China, live stream shopping is huge at the moment uh, with influencers uh, having the ability to sell products directly to their fans. Um, although this isn't very popular in India, Europe or the US, in fact, um, it's, it's one of the biggest sources of, of revenue in China and really kind of offers a, a unique and novel way um, the direct consumer area and that's everything for me as promised and um, there's a link there where you can access some more information about our methodology there's a bunch of free reports which go into much more detail than i've just covered there about some of the different trends in all the different countries so recommend you just go on that link and download those reports whilst you can but thanks um for listening francesca i will hand back over to you thanks very much jonathan it's fascinating actually Quite scary that so many children so young have mobile phones, but hey, there you go. <laughs> um, next on our list, we have Carla Silva. Carla is from King Features, Head of Licensing global, globally, and we'll talk about the trend towards the classics, particularly during the pandemic, but there is a general trend anyhow. So if I can hand over to Carla. 
Terrific. Well, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, Jonathan was super um, informative. I always say that knowledge is power, right? So these trends are so important. And what's most important is for us to actually apply what we learn into action. So, um, you know, so today I'm about to really give you a quick overview of what we've been doing with some of our classic brands and uh, really the importance of learning the trends that we've learned throughout this past year, which was so difficult for, for a lot of us. But, you know, what comes Companies have been doing in terms of, you know, how do we uh, leverage the opportunities? You know, where are the trends going? How can we adapt our business? How can we use our classic characters uh, to really make sure that we come out, you know, we bounce back, you know, quicker, better and faster. So that's what I'll be uh, talking about. And again, thank you to everyone. It's really exciting to be here. Um, just before, there were a lot of awards uh, for India, and I hope that a lot of our characters will be um, getting one award uh, next year uh, as well. So Francesca, I wanted to share uh, my screen, but um, I don't know if it's giving me the opportunity to do that. Can you see that? Uh, I don't think I yet. can. Okay. I've, st I've stopped sharing. I think one of the producers will probably be able to unlock that feature for you now. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I have to share something else. So this is not what, I okay. Ooh, um, <laughs> okay, great. So can you see it? Terrific. Yes. Uh, great. So there's a lot to cover. And so I'm just going to fly through these slides. Um, I think the most important thing is they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So we'll go through uh, the rationale for um, some of the programs we've done. And then I'll dive into the actual examples of what we've been doing. So uh, let's get started. Oh, I think we have to, to go to the beginning. I don't know what's happening. Okay. Okay. Classic collaborations. Um, good. I think there's some technical issues here. It's not moving. Oh. If I can ask the organizers, any clues? Okay. Um, yeah, okay. I actually see a few different polls here. Uh, terrific. So um, anyway, so why partnering with classic characters? I think, you know, uh, most and foremost, there's a high level of awareness for these brands. Um, as an example, I've had the opportunity to work with um, many of these classics. So I've worked on Snoopy and Garfield, and currently I'm working on Popeye and Olive Oil. So, um, you know, that my expertise has really been focused on classic brands and how do we reposition these brands? How do we reinvent them and introduce them to a new generation of fans? So High level of awareness, uh, there's a strong brand identity, especially during the pandemic. Everyone has been struggling with so many different issues. And these brands, these classic brands, really give you a sense of um, you know, certainty and positive feelings, this uh, feeling of nostalgia. So for the most part, um, you know, classic brands are associated, associated with positive values. And, um, you know, overall, I think uh, it's really important. Let me just see if we, if we go to the next slide. I don't know. It's it's not moving, I don't know why. So maybe I should just kind of go through it and speak through it. Um, I don't know why it's not actually, is anyone? Yeah, okay. Um, so I don't know why it's, it's going so, anyway. So, um, so I think it's uh, very important for us to, um, uh, for, you know, to collaborate with uh, uh, high profile companies and the social, I think I'm just going to kind of, how do I do this? I'm sorry, it's not going. I'm going to escape the, the slides. Can you, okay. Yeah, if you do it like that, then yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so basically, one of the things is that, um, you know, there's so many different ways for us to actually grow our classic brand. So uh, fresh style guides, entertainment and publishing. And Jonathan, you talked about direct to consumer. That's exactly what we've been doing. And given the time, I will really focus on collaborations uh, with high profile companies. So going through it. Uh, what does it make sense? You know, what are the benefits of collaboration? So a lot of times you have a wonderful brand and you have a great company. So the idea of collaborations is to make sure that you're able to increase your audience. And a lot of times your uh, channels of distribution, you can go into new markets and uh, you really broaden your opportunity to, uh, to leverage the marketing and, and the dollars associated with it. So, um, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons why we do collaborations, um, audiences, distribution, 
collaboration uh, and really using collaboration as the marketing tool for your brand. So you basically are joining forces. Um, so I just wanted to give you a quick ex example of um, some of the collaborations we've done through the years. And, and again, and as, Fr as Francesca said, um, for example, Popeye olive oil, these are brands that have been around for over 90, 100 years. Um, so it gives you an idea of the power of these brands and how they continue to really be strong. So here um, is an example of our partnership with Moschino. And uh, what's interesting is that, you know, when they started this collaboration um, in 1995, Five, so a long time ago, um, they started by using just the um, shape of the bottle um, was inspired by olive oil. So in terms of licensing, a lot of times you think that you're just using a character and you put it on a um, apparel or a product, but a lot of time you have to really be creative and use it in different ways. So, you know, why did this collaboration make sense? Um, again, you know, it's an iconic brand, it's aspirational. Uh, there's a lot of visibility and cool factor for that. Um, so, you know, that's really important to you. We really have to always tell the story when you're collaborating with another partnership or with another company. And then it's also important to, um, to see how we can expand into other products. So here's an example of, um, you know, we've done not only perfumes, but now we have accessories, one accessories, beautiful silk, silk scarves, and uh, when working uh, with these uh, companies, I think it's very important not only to expand the collection, but also give the liberty and the freedom to the artist to actually interpret the classic uh, characters. So um, here we gave a lot of, um, uh, you know, um, freedom. And, uh, you know, every year for the last you know, 25 years, we've been seeing beautiful product for a new generation. And that really gives you the cool factor uh, for the brand. Now, uh, another example is with uh, classic characters, basically it's across multiple generations. You have adults, you have children. And, um, you know, what we've learned earlier today, you know, I think the brands need to be relevant uh, and re relatable. And that's part of the secret sauce when you're actually launching um, a classic brand. How do you keep it um, relatable and relevant uh, aside from um, art, you know, artwork and so forth? So here's another example of our collaboration with uh, Benetton. So, you know, you have to be really authentic. You have to be um, always uh, sharing new art trend guides. And um, that's really important. So the creativity is key, especially for all of the brands, but especially with classic brands. And uh, as we learned, you know, um, what are the trends, right? So we heard that everyone is, you know, especially during the pandemic, uh, people are staying home. They're, you know, they're dress addressing with a leisure. They're more casual. They're eating healthier. So when, um, you know, really partnering with our with different uh, companies, we have to look at the categories that resonate uh, with the brand as well as with the consumer. So really understanding what um, what people uh, want, what they need, um, and then adapt our strategy strategy uh, into those categories. So this is um, a promotion that we did, a collaboration with the uh, wildlife in uh, Australia, again, focusing on uh, athleisure and fitness. This is uh, an example when we have a classic brand. Um, for example, we have Popeye, Olive Oil, Brutus. So we have such a wild um, number of characters. So what we do is um, we have exclusive artwork for different collaborations. So that's another way that you can really be creative. And even though it's a classic brand that has been around for a hundred years, you can really, um, you know, focus on different uh, brands and have exclusive collections. So here we have a collection for men, women, and children, and we really diversify the product mix uh, for the line. Um, here's a, uh, an example of CNA. This is like hot off the press. Um, so CNA in Mexico, uh, we basically did a, um, you know, a lot of times we say, hey, you know, in the digital area, there's really, uh, era, there's really no time for, um, you know, no space for like retail because we see that there's such a shift and stores are closing. Um, so, you know, there is an, an opportunity, of course, to continue to grow our brands. But what we need to do differently is we have to actually invest in campaigns you have to have exclusive content. You have to have a reason for the consumers to actually go to the store. Um, here's an example. Basically, um, we worked with five influencers um, in Mexico. Uh, we did um, exclusive content online. Social media is really very, very important. So we have to be creative. We have to be flexible and give the consumer a reason to go to the store and, you know, have that experience. 
And then in terms of trends, I think it's really important um, aligning with the cause, but it has to be authentic. You can't just slap, uh, you know, Popeye with any other uh, collaboration. So Popeye is, 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 you know, is always fighting for the underdog, is strong and, um, you know, is anti-bullying and he want, he's a sailor. And we wanted to make sure that we found a foundation that uh, really uh, spoke to the DNA of Popeye. What does it make sense? Well, we felt that, you know, he really wants to fight for the oceans and, and conservation for the oceans is very, very important. So um, thanks to our local agent, we work with a, a great uh, network of agents around the world. And, um, you know, we were brainstorming and we partnered with the sea cleaners. So this is one of the largest um, Manta. It actually was just launched in, um, in January. And this is the largest ship. And they basically are able to not only take the trash and plastic from the ocean, but actually recycle and actually reuse their product. So that's really the only, it's really very innovative technology. So we're really proud to be able to, um, to join forces with that. And, um, and how do we, you know, leverage that? So not only we have, we align with the cause and focus on sustainability, but also we have to make sure that our creative and also of our products, um, are focused on that eco-friendly sustainability. Um, you know, so it's not just about price and quality. You have to focus on inclusivity and sustainability. That's a trend that we're seeing, and uh, we started seeing actually the couple of years. And we've been very proactive. You know, from the learnings that Jonathan shared with us. You know, really having data is very important for us to be able to. Um, you know, to really work with the different companies. So all in all, um, I know we, we had a, a short period of time and this is just a little summary that I'll be able to share with everyone, but we've learned that the retail landscape has changed. Um, it, there's more globalization. You know, a, a lot of retailers really not only are selling more online, but they're going global. Um, we have to diversify our product mix. So if you're, if you're um, a consumer, and you're, you know, you're, you know, right now you're focused on eating healthy. So you're going to have more uh, Popeye spinach because Popeye loves spinach. So we actually saw the growth of our spinach, like kind of like double. It's incredible. We have everything from frozen and, and, um, and fresh spinach. So we adapt and that's the beauty. I mean, I could actually go with so many more examples. We also have another brand called um, Cuphead and we're going to have a series on Netflix, right? So um, I think the, the ingredients for success is to be able to be proactive, to, um, to adapt, to be flexible. You have to be you know, really quick to market, um, focus on sustainability. We saw, you know, I was actually surprised that 53% of all purchases were to direct to consumer, right? And um, when Jonathan mentioned that, I was like, wow, that's really growing. So we're seeing a growth of online brands. And then um, last but not least, I think the consumer, you have to serve your customer, um, not only through retail to make it, uh, you have to give it a reason for people to go to the stores, but you have to know uh, it's all about data. Uh, what are they shopping? What, what do they like? You know, what is your competition doing? How can you leverage those forces? And uh, when choosing um, a company to partner with, that's what we keep in mind, right? How can we join forces and, and how, how can we have a win-win collaboration? And, uh, when, you know, again, classic brands, you know, um, I think they're key, you know, for, for my experience, uh, these are some of the key takeaways, but you have to have a why, like, you know, it's the same thing in life, you know, sometimes we say, hey, you know, all philosophical, but we have to have a reason why we're collaborating, it has to be authentic, uh, you have to develop a unique collaboration that really creates the connection with the consumer. Because, for example, we have over 9 million fans with Popeye, but if you're partnering with another company of Moschino, or other brands that have a very um, uh, big following on social media. When you collaborate with another company, all of a sudden you're like doubly, tripling your audience. So new audiences, new markets, and you have to tell a story, right? Um, and the story that is aligned with your vision to make it really um, clear to the uh, consumer. And um, if you're listening and you're, you know, thinking of collaborations, you know, for this industry, of course, all those agreements, which is a discussion for another topic is very important. So make sure you have very clear um, agreement in place in terms of timing, the expectations. And uh, all in all, I think classic brands really give you strength um, and comfort uh, during such, you know, during such uh, challenging times that we're all facing. So that has worked for us. We've had a, a terrific year. Uh, we're looking forward to a very successful 21 with our classic brands. And I think it's important to have a diverse portfolio, right, of classic brands and others as well. 
So um, I hope today, you know, very quickly, I gave you um, an idea of why collaborations are really a great tool uh, to really uh, reach new customers and markets and really increase the customer um, experience for, for the classic brand. So tons of opportunities. Um, I'm going to, you know, you can stop sharing. Um, okay, great. Um, the presentation. So um, yeah, again, thank you so much. I, uh, it's a great topic. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I can't wait to hear about what Chris has to say also about video games and uh, the future of that industry as well. Thank you, Carla. And thank you particularly for starting so early as you're in New York. Starting at the crack of dawn is not the great, greatest way to start the I day. I, I woke up at 5 a.m. That's why I wanted to have some slides, just in case I forgot. <laughs> well, you've done really well. You can go back to bed now. <laughs> now it's all good. <laughs> Our final speaker is Chris Taddey, who's going to take us from, the, if you like, the comfort of the classic brands into the future and the way that the trends that where the future is heading um, in terms of what kids watch, how they watch it, everything else. So if I can hand over to Chris, over to you. Thank you very much, Francesca. Thank you, Carla. That's very, uh, very enlightening. And uh, I totally agree with you. We're all in a very disruptive world at the moment. Um, things have changed. We all know kids where they are. They're on their mobiles. That's the home. I started my career probably 30 years ago, um, working with two properties called World Wrestling Federation and Power Rangers, which continue to be highly successful. If I look back 30 years ago, it was all about the linear TV. It was all about appointment viewing, and that's what it is. That's how you absorbed your content. Power Rangers came onto TV in this country, in, in, especially in the UK, stripped five days a week. It was the only place a child could go and watch that program. We licensed it. We created one of the biggest programs. It became one of the biggest programs in the UK. Subsequently, we worked on World Wrestling Federation. Again, it was just at the point where Sky was launching in the UK. Um, again, it was appointment viewing. At this point, kids were trading DVDs. We were limited in what they can do. Now, the world of licensing has changed fundamentally. Um, there is content from every coming at you direction. And I think, as Jonathan said earlier, one of the core areas that it's coming from is gaming at the moment. Um, I think I saw statistics earlier that said there's something like 3 billion people playing uh, gaming on the planet. Kind of what's that? 20, 30% of the population has definitely been the biggest winner in the lo global lockdown. It's offering a offering a chance for children to connect with other children with the games they're playing. One of the biggest winners in this last 12 months has been Roblox. In fact, that game's been around since about 2006 in various iterations is growing. I think it, it heads to an IPO in, in New York next month where its valuation has tripled, doubled, quadrupled over the years. Fundamentally, children have sat down and they've connected with their friends when they've all been in lockdown and they've been playing those games. Birthday parties, they work together, they play the game. They video themselves playing those games. They, they load those video games and they share. It's created a huge brand within that mix. But it's not just Roblox, which we've seen at retail here in the groceries. We've seen Jazzwares with their toy line. Silvero IO is a game that's coming back again. Game, they're playing it. Four Guys launched early in 2020. Um, and now Fortnite. Probably one of those games that will be around for the next 20 years. It's so... It's now established it's so established in the way it's built its brand and how people are playing it um we'll kind of see that audience come through that when they were 12 you had 10 years they'll be 20 it'll be a retro brand but it will certainly be around for a very very long time the newest biggest hit we see at the moment in the mobile gaming space um among us you know i can see it from my own family they move from roblox to among us but they move back to roblox but among us is there it's it secured itself a toy licensee uh recently for a global rollout. One of the key things about licensing and mobile gaming is the speed to market. I think Carly indicated there. I think we're all in a very different world at the moment with licensing. It's all about getting speed to market. It's all about getting that product out there because consumers are expecting. Amazon can deliver to you in 24 hours. People want product. So e-commerce is obviously going to grow. And obviously we're seeing those gaming platforms utilizing their own e-commerce stores. Um, but remember, the get mobile gaming has grown phenomenally. But also not to forget, there's been the consoles, you know, the PlayStations, the Xbox. These have got a Call of Duty, Counter-Strike, the FIFA games. Again, there's a lot of sharing because it's obviously there within those platforms. It's very established licensing programs, which builds onto esports. So that is another growing area. So this whole area is both mobile gaming, consoles, esports. 
you've got you've got content aggregators like twitch showing people how to play these games in the competition we can see for the, with the downturn in cinema with the downturn in live events people have moved into this area but this isn't this isn't the only area that licensing has had to attack or become part of social media TikTok, which I think, as we all probably may know, was formerly called Musical.ly, um, and it's certainly built over the last 12 months. Short-form content, whether that, whether that is dance or whether that is now challenges that's coming through, music that's coming through. You have people like Jason Derulo who's launching their music through there. What, you have characters and brands coming through. Charlie D'Amelio, um, she recently, she probably has 100 million followers, 110 million followers on tiktok but f her content has been liked nine billion times um a phenomenal number you know a number that kind of in, in 30 years ago when i was doing wrestling i'd be lucky to get 100,000 viewers on sky for it now we're talking people liking videos and and sharing etc she's just done a collaboration with hollister um which i think is maybe moving to the second third season so you can see that that content is where we're at the, yeah. it's but it's also what is also done, these, co these contents also bring in back historic music, the back catalogues. The kids of today know Kiss as they know their new stuff. They want to be part of it. They know it. They've seen it because they're hearing it all the time. Outside of TikTok, obviously, I think we've also mentioned Instagram. Instagram is the home of the health and beauty, the lifestyle, the influencer. That area of business that people are utilizing to sell their products. So you've got Primark in this country that do not sell online, that only sell through store. They use the influencer. They're using Instagram. They're using the power of that image to sell those products. And recently, we've got more competitive platforms coming up. You know, Reels that Instagram have, or Thriller. There are new platforms coming through all the time. So here we've got a disruption there. We've got people where, how do we get to people we, through these devices? Outside of kind of the social, the mobile game, which we know is important, the console game, which is now important. We've got the video on demand. This really has, where before we had linear TV, We've now got YouTube and subscription service. If I look at YouTube, um, I think if I look at the top 50 channels on YouTube this year so far, 18 of those channels are coming out of India for a start. Um, and, and a huge amount of them are on kids' properties. Um, so you've got 18 channels coming out of India. The number one most viewed channels coming out of, which is a T-series, which is the song and so Bollywood um, song and dance. I think. But what has happened is the algorithm is being based on creating family-friendly content and families trust it. So you've got properties like Coco Melon coming through. You've got Bounce Party coming through. You've, got, you've had Ryan's World. You've had, we, had, we worked on a little bit. A couple of years ago, we worked on um, Little Baby Bum. It was the biggest nursery Ryan channel now. One of the reasons parents liked the channel, it became a babysitter. So they knew what it was and the repetition and within it, and this was indicated with Jonathan as well, it was the education element. So this channel taught you about shapes, colours, numbers and language. So there was that education, but it wasn't just a case of sitting a child in front of the TV. Here we're utilising YouTube as the device to launch. But it's not just nursery rhymes. As we've seen, we've got Vlad and Nick, which is a, a programme now being supported by Nickelodeon. Um, as I mentioned before, we've got Bounce Party, which is similar to a, a Wiggles program in the UK, Cosmic Kids Yoga. So coming back to the educational piece, when we went into lockdown, people were looking for how they can do exercise. So we had Joe Wicks here doing a class on TV and his YouTube channel. We also had, and then had Cosmic Kids, which was about teaching kids about mindfulness, about the world and how it works. And that's grown. So the growth of, so outside of YouTube and the kind of advertising funded devices, we've obviously got the SVODs, you know, you know, we've got, we knew Disney Plus launched just as lockdown came about, but obviously we've had Amazon Prime, which we've indicated for and Netflix. Netflix have heavily invested into content. So here we have, this time last year, we were probably all talking about Tiger, Tiger King. We've had the Queen's Gambit, we've had Lupin, we've had Bridgerton. They've all come through. Can they all be success? Some shows can. We've got Stranger Things have been hugely successful licensing programs. They've managed to utilize the strength and the fan base. And again, about selling to the consumer that's there. Um, with, but also these esports have relaunched the classic properties. You know, the films, whether it's Mean Girls, whether it's Friends, easier access for, for the young fans and for people to think, you walk into retail, it, you will see a lot of these brands at retail. 
because they're safe. The retailer knows them. Um, it is the mobile device that's kind of driven all this. I, definitely. It's the person who's in control. You know, 30 years ago, it wasn't around. It was that linear thing. Today, we've got this. It's about consumption. But having said that, you know, films will come back. As we all know, the Bond movie has been held back for time after time now because they want that big effect. They want that big noise as it goes into the cinema. That's kind of where it's a disruptive market. There's a lot of content out there coming into all different directions. I kind of, one thing I'd finally say, you know, there's a kind of property I've seen on the radar. It's a property called Has Been Hotel. Um, launched in 2019, crowdfunded, um, freelance animation, a 30-minute pilot has now been viewed 54 million times. The site has over 5 million subscribers. And its creator, it was a passion project for them. And it's now been sold into animation to go into TV. So we're now entering a new world of how we launch stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Fascinating how life has changed, say, over the last 20, 30 years. Um, I wonder if we can get to some questions now, because I know I've had some questions sent in. And one thing I, that drew me to, there's obviously been a downturn because of the pandemic in live events. They haven't been able to happen anywhere more or less in the world. With the world opening up, which inevitably it will, please God, um, <coughs> will that, really, we've all had enough of it now, will that take away from things like esports? and the online, or will the two live happily together? I wonder if I could ask, well, all of you for your comments, really. Who'd like to start? Jonathan, let's start with you. Oh, then, yeah, I'll start. Yeah, well, apart from live events, I know that the crickets, England crickets on in India at the minute, they've got limited, uh, limited attendance there. So, yeah, things starting to come back slowly. Um, in terms of, I, no, I think... The, the, the trend for esports and live virtual events, I think, has only gone one way. I think, um, yeah, we see the likes of, like Chris touched upon, kids kind of using these virtual worlds more of a necessity than anything. Kids hosting birthday parties in Minecraft or some kids have now watched their first concert for the first time ever in Fortnite. <laughs> um, so those kind of things, they were novel, but I think, um, no, they've kind of set the, the path for the future. Obviously, live events will come back and they've got their own special place. But no, I think um, kind of Chris didn't mention it, but it was, we were just talking around it and it's getting to this idea of uh, what Fortnite would call the metaverse, this entirely virtual yes. world where they anticipate that we'll all be living in this, in this separate virtual world, which is really interesting. I think that's probably the way things are heading. Lord. Well, I, I kind of, from my point of view, I have a, a 16-year-old here who, who, after the announcement, demanded we buy Reading tickets, at, uh, which is a big festival in the UK, uh, at the end of August, and had no choice but to buy this because they want to go back to this. I think one of the big changes we may see in live events has been the immersive experience about getting involved with it. I think very soon a Doctor Who experience opens up. It allows for social distancing um, and it allows people to become part of it. So, yes, it, it, uh, things will adapt um, and new IPs will come through. And that, But, yeah, I definitely kind of see immersive experiences as being one of those kind of trends that we'll see going forward. You see the two worlds running happily side by side. Carla? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's, I, I agree with Chris and Jonathan. I think um, esports will continue to grow. Um, I think we all have to adapt, right? So we're looking at things differently. Um, a friend of mine actually um, is really investing in the movie theater world, and uh, they're actually looking at opportunities to turn that into kind of an esport competition. So you're able to actually, instead of going to just watch a movie, what else can you do? Because I think things will actually shift. Of course, that um, everyone wants to watch a movie but I think the experience is different people want to be more involved so they're actually looking into turning these movie theaters here in the U.S. into actual actually ways for people to go and watch esports right so you we're actually seeing that trend and I think we'll continue to do that um, but again I think being innovative and um, those experiences I think they're very important like we actually had this um, in China for example that's really big you know one of the things that we do is actually do a lot of the exhibits um, and then we involve different artists from around the world we have to have experiences you have 
have to make it fun uh, and personable for the consumer. So I think we're going to continue to see that trend. I think they both can coexist, but I think, again, flexibility is key. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It is flexibility and delivering in a different way. You know, we work with the Van Gogh Museum and one of the things they do is projection. Um, and we see a lot of that. If you can't go, get to Amsterdam to see the original paintings, let's project. Let's then create the story around it. Um, it's, it's, it is when you go on YouTube and you see kind of concerts there and you play and you think, oh, <laughs> how, how this kind of lack of kind of experience and I was there kind of moments. But, exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, I always say, you know, the best, <laughs> way, the best way to predict the future is to create it, right? And I think <laughs> all of us, um, all of us here um, in, in, in this room and, uh, you know, I think we have an opportunity, right, to see what can we learn, what can we do differently in a new world and create it. And um, again, we've been doing with classic brands. There's so many other brands and new IP that is coming out. But um, I I have two little boys and they're always playing games. I mean, they don't even watch TV anymore, right? They have their iPads Mm -hmm. and that's the way they're they're watching and that's the reality. So how do we adapt the content that we create to make sure that we have our consumers watching it, right? Yeah, you're right. Right. Do we have the problem then of having almost too much content? I mean, as, as <laughs> yes. we had linear TV, in the UK we had three channels, you know, and if it wasn't on the BBC or ITV, basically, forget it. Now you've got thousands. So yep. how, how do properties come through that? Other than the big studios that can put millions and millions of marketing dollars behind it, how do properties come through that wash of others? Go on, Jonathan, you go. Yeah, Jonathan. Um, yeah so from personal experience, yeah, you spend, spend uh, 10 minutes scrolling on Netflix and then you just put something on you've already seen before. It's that kind of yeah. phenomenon you don't want to feel like you're missing out. So put something on that you know is good. Um, so it's kind of you, you stick to that content that you know. But yeah, I think it's, it's very tricky. I guess one of, the, one of the areas, though, linking back to what Chris said, who are kind of commanding attention for hours upon end is esports and live streamers and gaming on Twitch. People sit and watch for hours and, and hours and just one person playing games. So it, it, it can be done. There are kind of there are content creators out there at, attracting these audiences. Mm. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think also, um, it really depends. But you know, it's really focused and how do we control that, right? So it's not you know, there's so much content and we're living it right now. Even even for me, there's so many things. You know, we talked about mindfulness and how everyone is, um, there's so many different apps, right? And um, there's almost too much to choose from. That's how I feel. A lot of times I don't even know which one to pick. So I download, download all of them and then I'm like, okay, I'm even more confused. Um, so how do we focus, right? And, and, um, and really you're building that community. Um, and, um, and I think we're going to see more and more and more of that. I think people need connection. I think it's time for us to pick up the phone and, and, and reach out and call mm-hmm. a lot of things. It's, you know, it's just like, you know, again, we, we were forced to actually not do some of these trade shows as an example. Um, but you know, now I think we have to reach out and connect. Um, and I think as we have more content, we're able to actually, um, and again, segment our, um, customer and, and create really, um, um, you know, content that is focused on what they really like. So there's opportunity for all, but yes, it, it's going to be a lot. And we have to be, again, creative and to think outside of the box and to ma- make sure that we maintain the attention of our consumer. And it's also different um, for different, you know, again, the brands that I represent, classic brands, you know, mostly we've, we've been doing adults, but then we're really focusing on a younger demographic. So we're able to touch, um, you know, all generations, which I love. But it's also a challenge, right? Because you're always introducing the brand to a new generation. So I think, um, you know, one of the keys, and that's one of the things I, I've touched upon, is the importance. As if you're a licensor or a licensee or a retailer, the um, the importance of it's kind of investing. You have to have, you know, different investments in different baskets, right? Making sure that you have a mix of um, content uh, for that specific audience. I think that will be key, you know, for our future as well. Thank you. Just as a final thing, it would be interesting. I mean, the world has basically stopped for the last 12 months and we've all tried to find ways of communicating or doing whatever we want to do, but it's not been easy. Just in in a very few words, what good has come out of this pandemic, do you think, in terms of our business? 
Jonathan? Um, I guess I'll repeat what the, what the kids were saying is that their their aspirations have changed. They now they they're not aspiring to be sports stars and celebrities and Instagram and Instagram influencers. They want to be nurses, doctors, and scientists. So I guess that's a good thing. Yeah. Carla. Um, yeah, I, I think um, you know. I think going back to basics. I think true values never go out of style, right? Um, and I think uh, a lot of times it, you know, we have to stop and look what's really important: the ability that we've had to spend more time um, with our families and and really stop to think. There's so much noise out there, so um, it's a time for us to to evolve, um, to use technology, but it's also a time to reflect and look at basics. Because at the end of the day, you know, everything is to recycle. And it's really important for you to be true to yourself and figure out what's really important and teach that to our, um, to our kids and our young, younger generation. And be able to do that through our work. Because at the end of the day, we have to feel passionate about it. And that's why licensing is so important. We have to make a difference. So, you know, it was interesting, Jonathan, you said about reading, you know, um, and, and, and India and other parts. I mean, publishing is such a key driver and so important as we introduce our brands to a new generation. So I think um, the beauty of it is people are reading. People need to, you know, quiet their minds and focus on what's really important and ask themselves, you know, what do I want to do? What's my passion? And, and I think what we've seen, even with some of the brands that have launched online only, is that people want to be themselves. I think um, there was all of these standards and you know everything is perfect, but the reality is the world is not perfect. Not everyone is perfect. So how can we adapt and make sure that we're not alone um, in this world? So I think true values um, and flexibility and connection is what we've learned from this uh, pandemic. Christopher? I think I would agree with Carla there. I think it's the adaptability. It's, it's to show that things may not always be the same and you've got to learn to adapt and you've got to be learn to accept what's there and what's happening. Definitely. I think that's the key. And, and coming back to family, relying that it's people around you that are going to drive you. It isn't the next shiny big phone, even though that's still what they'll say, but family adaptability. Mm. Mm. Fascinating. Well, thank you all very much for today. Um, hopefully our audience have found it interesting. I know that the whole session has been recorded, so everybody will get a copy, which is interesting. Um, and I'd just like to thank you all, really, for, for taking part and being and really giving a lot of food for thought, actually, um, from statistics to different types of properties to goodness knows where the market's going. Um, <laughs> yes. Thank you, Patricia. Thank, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thanking all our panelists for such a wonderful discussion and especially thanking our moderator for carrying it out so beautifully. Thank you so much, ma'am. My pleasure. It's been very interesting, really interesting from all our points of view. So thank you. <laughs>